Hey everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Not quite true crime, definitely history for sure, but uh, we're talking some kind of tragic type of stuff today. Um, you know, going through the history, some early 1980s heavyweight action with my buddy Arispina, who's of course CompuBox operator, but just history dude like myself. Where the fuck is it going, Aris? Not bad, my man. Not bad at all. Uh, the weather weather has been a little nasty these past few days. Kind of cold on this. And how about yourself? Cold? Yes, it's been cold, rainy. The act actually, you know, it's the perfect kind of weather to stay in and either listen to a podcast about boxing history or watch a little video about boxing history, like we're about to provide today. Talking about John Tate, Big John exactly. Tate, man. Exactly. Heavyweights, not the one on my sweatshirt, but um. You know, uh, classic heavyweight nonetheless. And um, yeah, so, you know, John Tate is an interesting subject. The reason why I, I broached the idea to you uh, a couple of weeks back is because we've mentioned him on the show before. We've, you know, talked about him. We've talked about heavyweight history, other guys like Trevor Burbick or whatever it may be. But John Tate is one of those guys that's been almost forgotten in history, even though it wasn't that long ago when he was active. I mean, yeah, you know, 40 years is a decent amount, but I mean, in the time has passed with the event of like all the video that you see and the fact that he was active in the late 70s and early 80s, it doesn't seem that long ago. That makes sense, right? So, well, and, and the other guys, uh, you know, his contemporaries, especially the people that he, you know, got famous with initially, most of them are either alive or were alive very recently of, you know, recent memory. So it's kind of like for him to just not really get talked about, it's pretty weird. It is, it is, especially um, him is that like his his reign at the top was very brief, and the fall that he had after that was a tragic and massive fall that happened pretty rapidly, and as times pass, especially in boxing, if your name at the top wasn't that long, it can be forgotten, even if it was pretty you know well lit in the time that it was there. So yeah, John Tate deserves his flowers, and that's why we got to talk about him today. So to give a little context about John Tate and, um, you know, the era that we're getting into right here, let's think about it again. This is 1979 uh, and 1980. The heavyweight division is an absolute turmoil at this point, right? Um, all kind of started, you know, all, all the disastrous parts of what we got brought into kind of started in 1978 when Leon Spinks beat Muhammad Ali. All right, let, let's just keep it a W. Let's, let's keep it real here. Ali loses to Spinks. Massive upset. And... Okay, yeah, he comes back and beats him in a rematch, whatever. But before that happened, the titles were already got splintered. And that was the first time. Well, not really the first time. Like we mentioned, you know, uh, Ernie Terrell was WBA champ, and they had that tournament and the whole thing back in the 60s. So, I mean, they were already kind of like splintered. But by the time Frazier and Ali got together in 71, you know, and Frazier had beaten Jimmy Ellis, like everything was already unified and it stood that way for a long time up until, again, 1979, and 78, 79. Spinks refuses to fight Ken Norton, obviously wants to get a more lucid rematch with Ali. So that gets split. Don King jumps into that, you know, steals that up. And then we go from Ken Norton to Larry Holmes and yada, 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 right? So that leaves the WBA in a tailspin. Muhammad Ali retires in 1979, um, gives up the belt, and Bob Arum decides to hold an impromptu tournament to crown a new champion. After a lot of finagling and other stuff going on, John Tate becomes, you know, undisputed champ. So we'll jump to that and that how that happened in a bit. But, um, Pat, you know, I'll let you take it off to start here with uh, giving a little bit about his background. Yeah, and, and it actually goes a little bit deeper. <laughs> it, it, it Not to say that you're uh, – you kind of skipped over some stuff, at least with the detail as far Absolutely. as the, w, yeah, I was just the giving WBA. Like a... And, yeah, I know you didn't do it like, you know, like that, but uh, it goes a little bit deeper than – um basically Ali giving up the title Bob Arum Absolutely. Bob Arum convinced uh Ali to give up the title for a sum of four hundred thousand dollars and basically um this all tied together because as you said you mentioned Leon Spinks the Spinks brothers were on the 1976 Olympic team along with Ray Leonard of course Ray Leonard was kind of like the breakout star the darling of the 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 big story or the household story i should say of the 1976 team but it was a really successful team obviously and uh the successful heavyweight who didn't win gold but nonetheless won bronze and made a name for himself at the olympics too among uh, a really great team was john tate and so uh you know coming through all of this 
all of this developed so quickly. The heavyweight division had been in turmoil even uh, since Muhammad Ali defeated Sonny Liston. You know what I mean? Even after that, like the the sanctioning bodies were like, ah, you know, like we we, we might want to strip this clown. Like he's already changing his name and doing you know, all this type of stuff. And that's weirdness out. The public was against him, generally speaking. And it wasn't until a lot of his issues became far more political that a chunk of the American public and really anybody white cared at all to get behind him. And so that being said, um, the heavyweight division had been in a lot of turmoil. But when, like you said, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali basically hashed this shit out when Muhammad Ali came back out of exile. And ever since then, it, there was no question as to who the heavyweight champion was. And this is the picture that John Tate had initially come into, except for when Leon Spinks scored a massive upset over Muhammad Ali. <laughs> you know, it added more turmoil for a whole bunch of reasons. But uh, when Muhammad Ali won the rematch and he was kind of just like, man, I'm getting the hell out of here while the getting's good, or at least tried to. Um, Sol Kersner, who we brought up when we did the episode on Sun City, we went into far more depth about that. Sol Kersner is a dude who helped develop the resorts and casinos and hotels in South Afri in and around South Africa, and he was good friends with Bob Arum. And so uh, when Bob Arum paid Muhammad Ali $400,000 to give up the heavyweight title, a whole bunch of people in the media and in boxing were basically like, Bob Barum's an idiot. What is he doing? That's too much money to be, you know, the title's already split. It's a waste of money. He's going to wind up losing that money, et cetera, et cetera. Because they had already kind of continued on in the WBC with Larry Holmes, who was seen as uh, a far more legitimate answer, you know, to the heavyweight champion if, if Muhammad Ali was indeed going to retire. And so that being said, uh, Bob Arum turned that around pretty quickly, which we'll get to later. But uh, as far as circling back to John Tate, um, you know, the whole story coming into this heavyweight picture was that the overarching theme is he's a guy from humble beginnings. That might yes. even be an extreme. That might even be an extreme understatement. Um, the well, truth... uh, don't to cut you off, but like to even to start even from the beginning, he's kind of like you mentioned Sonny Liston earlier. Um, same thing with the birthday. No one really knew Sonny Liston's exact birthday. No one really knew John Tate's exact birthday. Yep. That's something that we see, um, I mean, for reasons, and I'm not saying good reasons, like I like them, but something that we see with a lot of black people in the South and American South, uh, born around a certain time, Archie Moore, Archie Moore yep. is another one whose birth date was in question. Um, but uh, this is something that n a lot of people might not know that birth records and family trees and those kinds of things before the advent of the internet, uh, uh they were generally kept through places like churches, mm -hmm. uh, town halls, uh, county assessors, whatever those kinds of things, you know, or the older versions of those things, but churches were probably the most common way to, uh, have a census or whatever around these times. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of black communities were basically forgotten about with a lot of these uh, mechanisms for counting populations and stuff like that. So a lot of people didn't know their family tree, like how a lot of like white Europeans and shit are able to easily trace back to fucking like 1281 or some shit in fucking England. A lot of people uh, whose family were among black Americans back in the day are not able to go far, that far back. And so this was in question, too, for John Tate. Uh, he was born at some time in Arkansas in 1955, but there is some debate as to when exactly he was born. I want to say it was in January or something, they believe. But point is, he came from fairly extreme poverty, uh, extreme enough that even in an area that had a lot of poverty, the people who were already living in poverty looked at his family and were like, damn. And so, I mean, the point is that his family was in fairly bad shape in that regard. Um, according to pretty much any source that you and I had seen over here, 
He had done a bunch of very physical types of jobs like picking cotton, picking apples, picking produce and that kind of thing, which stuff you know, that builds up your muscles, but it doesn't really, and it's not easy. Doesn't uh, pay shit. Making anything. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't pay shit and it's not easy and it goes nowhere. You know, all it does is just make you tough as fuck. Yeah. Or just beats you down. You know yes. what I mean? It, you know, yeah. if you're lucky, it makes you tough, tough as fuck. And he is a guy who was six, three, six, four, uh, oh, two, 200 plus pounds and just a large large dude never did very well in school got picked on in school because of his size and eventually uh found his way into a boxing gym um you know didn't really according to him and according to the trainers pick up a whole lot but uh was i guess talented enough to make his or fight his way into the national golden gloves, which was being held in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so when he went to Knoxville, Tennessee, he apparently had a victory over one of the fighters in the golden gloves. That was like, that was well, known. Was like, you know, you're getting to the point. I was like, yeah, the, the guy that he defeated was known for not being, you know, uh, invincible, but very difficult to defeat. And he kind of came out of nowhere and defeated this guy, which was a shock to a bunch of people. And a local trainer named Ace Miller apparently went up to him and was like, hey, if you can find your way back to my gym, I'll teach you. I'll take you in, blah, blah, blah. And that's exactly what happened. He took him into his family and he and uh, John Tate became a part of this guy's family, basically living among his family and uh, doing odd jobs and things like that. And that's kind of where John Tate's story uh, and his path to the yeah. Olympics, which was then a springboard into the pros, kind of began. Absolutely. And so we're talking about now when John Tate is actively in the amateurs, this is like the early 70s. And we've discussed this on past shows. We're at like one of the deepest eras in amateur boxing history. You know what I mean? It was ridiculously tough. All right. I mean, it's tough enough trying to make the Olympic team now and national golden gloves and all this other stuff. But <clears throat> the talent that was around back then and the activity that you had back then, like you were fighting all the time. It was not unusual. When you see a guy like Lomachenko's record and you see that he had like over what, how many fights did he have? Over 400, 500 close or something around there. Like when you see that type of activity and, you're just, and your, your mind gets like exploded by like, how can someone fight that many times? That was normal back in the 70s. That was normal for those guys. They were fighting multiple times a week. They were fighting every weekend. The way you and I would just, you know, watch boxing on uh, Showtime or the zone or whatever it is these guys were actively fighting like they just fought all the time every single weekend there was a tournament there was something else going on you're building yourself up to be there and it was difficult as shit to make it to the you know to the olympics because the talent pool was so deep and even though tate was a little just a little bit like older and more experienced than the guys that he had to fight he had to fight some rough asses that made names for themselves later on in their careers guys like um uh michael dokes you know, and Tony Tubbs and other heavyweights like that. He had to, you know, those were guys he had to fight to get to make that Olympic team. All right. He had to fight Dokes in the trials. Dokes was a beautiful amateur standout who lost a close decision to Teofilo Stevenson when he was like only 16 or 17, which is wild to think about. You know, a dude at that age would probably get his shit knocked out and head into the nosebleed section. And Dokes went the distance with him. He got dropped, but he performed admirably, admirably. And he was a hell of a fighter. Tate was able to beat him, and then I believe he had to beat, um, I think it was future contender Marvin Stinson, like two out of three or something like that, for him to to make, you know, he beat him, and then I think he lost, and then he had to beat him again in the trials, uh, not the trials, the box-offs, to, to make the team, which he did. And 76 team, I mean, what else can be said about them? Like, they're one, they probably are, you know, aside from 84, um, the most highly touted and, you know, thought about team in history, right? Like, just think of the stars that came from that, too, because, you know, like you mentioned the aforementioned Sugar Ray Leonard. You had the Sphinx Brothers. Um, you you had Howard Davis Jr., who was really personable himself. You know, there was so many good fighters from that group. And back then, amateur boxing was televised so often. Like, not just we're talking Olympics, but I mean, like, you know, all the amateur meets when you would have the USA against Russia or USA against Cuba, mm -hmm. USA yep. against Canada. Those were all be aired on ABC or one of those channels or on those channels. All these amateurs that you saw coming up, they were becoming household names just like the pros because they were being featured so often on TV. 
And like you mentioned too, with Rocky coming out and America being taken by storm, fucking best picture, um, all, all, you know, everything was in motion for this team to succeed. And then they, the hell of it that they did, you know what I mean? They dominated, you know, at that games and stuff like that. Tate did it, all right? Tate didn't make, win a gold medal like his contemporaries. But I mean, great reason why T.O. Fiel Stevenson was in, was in his way. Stevenson, arguably, you know, I mean, the great, probably the greatest uh, amateur heavyweight ever and one of the greatest amateurs ever. The guy was an absolute legend for a reason. And he dominated the scene, especially at the Olympics. You know, he lost a couple of, like, he would lose to a guy like Dwayne Bobbick sometimes in a, in a different tournament. But when it came to the Olympics, Stevenson was just tuned in and usually knocked the shit out of everybody that he fought. And Tate did well for himself to make it to the quarter, you know, to make it to, what was it, the quarterfinal round or to fight Stevenson? That's what it was. That's what you do. I, I get think so, yeah. Bronze. Well, yeah, because that's how he got the bronze, yeah. So, and I mean, I get it, you know, he's moving in and stuff like that. But Stevenson, like those type of guys with those radar right hands, pow, hits him with one. And you see Tate, like, it's like a delayed reaction. He takes yeah. it. Initially. Yeah, he like, he like sat down. He was like, huh. Yeah. huh. Like initially, huh. like you can just see like, it was like his brain and his body quite at, like, didn't like, you know, click yet like, to, to what just happened. And they were trying to, and then t- once they reacted, his body was just like, mm-mm, nope, nope. You know what? We're done. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. I mean, it was, it, it's a hard knockout, man. It's not, a, it's, it's like, he wasn't knocked unconscious, but like, clearly he was rattled and. It, it looked like a Richard Pryor skit when the legs are just like, nah, nah, stay up. Your legs like, nah, man, fuck you. We're going down now. And that's exactly what happened, you know. Anybody but who's, no who's shame. been hit enough knows that, like, it, I, dude, sometimes you see a knockout and people are like, it's a fix. And I'm like, mm. I, I've been hit all sorts of ways. And there have been times where I've been hit and I didn't get knocked down. But I was like, hold on. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Because <laughs> it's like, it like stops you for a second. You're just like, what the fuck? Especially so, if you I buy it. Certain areas, like if you get crushed on the chin, sometimes you know you can have a chin of granite. But a guy like Stevenson that hits the way he does, it's gonna be hard to take a punch like that. Get hit in the side of the head by the ear. I mean, those are all logical places where I've definitely been hit and done. You know, the stanky leg afterwards from it. Like it's the name of the game. Tank gets stopped, but he proves himself enough and enough metal that like he's gonna. You know, in the fact that he was a part of the seventy sixteen. He, he's going to, you know, have some publicity when he turns pro. Plus, he's a heavyweight, you know. So as he gets through the rankings, like, he, he turns pro. And like we mentioned, too, now this division is kind of wide. I mean, I wouldn't say completely wide open. Ali is clearly slowing down. But it, it, you can clearly see that there's changes in the wind right here, right? By the time Tate turns pro, Ali is slowing down to a nub. Frazier is basically done. Foreman is about to be retired by Jimmy Young. Um Ken Norton is still around meandering, but I mean, like we said, he he's nearing the end himself besides having a great 78. And so the division is becoming wide open now, you know what I mean? And like the guys, the old war horses that used to hang around, guys like Ron Lyle and Ernie Shavers and such like that, um, they were still there, but they were slowing down themselves too. And then, so it was up to the young guys to come up because the current crop of contenders that they had was just kind of like, man, eh, you know? And you know what's actually a really good guide to kind of to boost what you're saying is you can go on to Box Rec. Shout out to our homeboy Gray Johnson, yes, sir. who controls Box Rec and is responsible for every decision ever made on Box Rec. Go find him, Gray Johnson. Just kidding, not really. But <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what's actually uh, they have the month by month ratings, ring ratings, and you can look through month by month on you know for the heavyweights for instance and you can see you can see when shit starts to change you start to see a couple of dudes creep into the top 10 rankings that you're like yeah yeah the fuck and so you can start to see when shit's kind of going south and so the division is more or less open for a guy to like really take lead and you know see what they can do and that's when things start shaping up tate in his first year um I don't even have his record up, but like, give me one second here. Um, uh, yeah. Oh. So, in his first year as a pro, like, you know, you look at the names on these type of guys, and like, at first, you know, through to the early part of 77 and the 78, you're not going to see a bunch of recognizable names with the exception of maybe Harold Carter. And not even for anything good. That guy has just been around for literally forever. But 
by the time of late seven in the mid 78 going into 79 that's when you start seeing the names start popping up bernardo mccardo who was a hell of a heavyweight himself um and last, unbeaten at the time yes unbeaten at the time um would end up knocking out trevor burbick in the first round um would end up knocking out ernie shavers um had a war and a half with leon spinks all around solid guy but he stops him uh walter santamore another guy that was around for that would end up being around for a long time and be you know journeyman fringe contender type person no one that really bridged it but a guy that definitely was a tough fighter johnny boudreau <laughs> um <laughs> if you know about john you know johnny boudreau is most known for his infamous um fiasco after the u.s championship um fights where he got that dubious one over Scott Ledoux. And then Ledoux obviously pissed, and rightfully so, because Boudreaux had no business winning that fight. Um, well, Boudreaux is about to get interviewed, John, uh, Scott Ledoux. And this is why, you know, Scott Ledoux is a complainer. This is not a guy that held his emotions in at all. If he thought something was wrong, he was going to say something about it. And he came over, and the first thing he did while Boudreaux was about to get interviewed, Scott Ledoux walked out of the ring on the apron and threw a kick at him. And then a fiasco ensued where Boudreaux and them charged at him. And then you see like a fucking cartoon, Howard Cosell's toupee flip up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then you see him scammering and trying to pull it back down in, in the corner over there while all this craziness is ensuing. And um, yeah, that's what Johnny Boudreaux is probably most known for, aside from losing to John Tate and eventually Harry Cosilla. And, um, and all those comedy Roy movies Co where motherfuckers are like, like putting their fucking toupee on like come hell or high water that's legitimate bro like those motherfuckers will be in a burning building still looking for their toupee <laughs> like trying to especially a guy that was as vain as howard cosell you oh, know howard. cosell carried himself in this way he was a celebrity which he actually was the dude was a legit celebrity but you know the way he loved to schmooze with everybody and always seemed he was this and that and a cigar and he always wore that peacock yellow abc jacket everywhere he went and they said that too, even when he wasn't working, he always had to wear it because he's, you know, was a part of him. So the last thing you would imagine he would want for them to happen is to have his two go flipping up, up, you know, anyways. Um, and then also too, the another guy to mention was uh, Roy Cookie Wallace, who was another journeyman at the time, but a guy that should be mentioned because, and you'll agree with me, Pat, he has one of the most underrated and one of the greatest Afros in boxing history. That dude had Absolutely a goal no that was on point. Like huge, you yeah, know, this is, hmm? puffy, just hemped afro. Absolutely, just I'm talking like you know he was picking that thing for hours, man. That shit was glorious. <laughs> there's actually a photo. I don't think I have the magazine right next to me, but there's a photo of him getting his ass kicked by Bunny Johnson, and the fro is just immaculate while he's getting punched right in the mouth. <laughs> but but that's the but that's the downside is that you know you get that shit knocked sideways. Or if you get it knock funky, then it's like visible. You know what I mean? Like, it's the downside. Well, Cookie Wallace was a tough guy. He's another guy that didn't have a great record, but like, if you needed rounds and you needed somebody who was going to give you experience, you definitely went in with him. So that was all really good. That was a good buildup for what was going to be his first major national fight. And it's against our old friend, Dwayne Bonick. <laughs> you know, they built Dwayne Bob Bobick up so much because, I mean, you know, the idea of having a white heavyweight or I mean, the idea, especially of going into the seventies and calling guys white hopes and stuff like that, probably a little bit much uh, yeah. uh, going into South Africa. However, <laughs> let's, we might have to reset that idea, but like, um, you know, in the U S yeah, I don't know about that so much, but regardless the idea that the white public or that the boxing establishment or whatever would like a white heavyweight champion, it's not an unfounded idea. It's it is founded in reality, and I do think that generally speaking, it's something that, as long as it's a bankable white heavyweight, they they would want one for for sure. But uh, for now, I think they they would just settle for like you know an American heavyweight champion. These fools have been I don't give a shit either way. But it, they're the idea of wanting a white heavyweight champion or whatever is there, and they had propped up endless amounts of dudes and Dwayne Bobbick was kind of the latest uh you know whatever heavyweight white heavyweight guy that they were trying to push toward the top he was a very good amateur um but you've mentioned this numerous times that it's just when he got hit he got hit like in the face he would be like <laughs> uh -huh. 
uh, he like had this grimace where he was just like, "Oh, dude, like you're cooked because you're like give it. You had you got no poker face, dude." And so he he would just go down swinging, I guess. But you know his defense was just in shambles by the time he got hit. And so I showed. But- well, he was still bankable, though, is the point. Is yes. it was he'd already kind of been exposed, like everybody already knew, like, all right, this guy doesn't really have a chin, but he was still bankable. I mean, you know, it's funny. Like, I remember I showed a, a friend of mine one time. She's I'm she's learning, you know. I mean, she's not a big boxing fan, but I've shown her a few things. And she um I was gonna show her Bobic and Norton one time, and before the fight, she was looking at it and she made a face, and I was like, What? And she was like, I don't know, I just got a bad feeling something's gonna happen to the redhead guy. <laughs> And I was like, and I smiled, and as it started, it, it was the funniest thing to, to hear. She was like, oh, oh, God, oh, no, wow, oh, oh, my God, he looks like he's in so much pain, oh, poor thing, oh, Jesus. Like, it was, you know, it, it, it was pretty hysterical to watch because, like, that's the general reaction. But um, at this point, Dwayne Bobick, after that fiasco uh, against Ken Norton when he was blasted in one round at Madison Square Garden, uh, what was that, 1977? I think so, yeah. Yeah. He built himself back up after that, you know, with a number of wins. It was like in the double digits between like 10 to 15 wins or whatever it was that he that he built himself up with. And he was with a new manager, which was um, Dave Wolf. And um, Dave Wolf, you know, with uh, Ray Mancini fame. Actually, I got to take that back. He had one hiccup before then. That was, was against another guy we're going to bring up in a minute who we've talked about before on the show, Cali Knutza. And he was shockingly knocked out by him in South Africa. That's what put Knitza on the map. But then again, he started building himself up again because, like you said, Pat, Bobic, he was still, you know, he still had a name. And if you had, and he had, you know, because he was a white heavyweight and he was still kind of popular and an Olympian and whatever it may be, like he was a likable dude. He's from, you know, the Midwest, Bullis, uh, Minnesota. He had a big family, a nice backstory and all that. And, you know, he made for fun fights. It's just sometimes he'd get hit and he'd get hurt. But, like, on the most part, he was he was a fun fighter to watch. So it built himself up, and Dave Wolf showed himself. I, I know after the fight, after he lost to Knutza, that he stood in South Africa, actually started a movie I think was called Billy Boy or something like that, and became pretty popular out there. He got a few wins and everything else. So, you know, he's riding the wave of momentum. And also, too, he was on a new training system. I forgot the exact name of it, but it was cutting edge for the time. And Bobic talked about losing a lot of weight and like running 10 to 15 miles a day and doing this and doing that. And everything was just like a lot. Di- the, the stuff he was doing was just very cutting edge. And it was supposed to help him in this way because he was in the best shape of his life. And, you know, no way he's going to lose to a guy like John Tate. And he said that before the fight, he planned on fighting until 84 and becoming champion. Okay, cool. So what ends up happening? He gets his ass kicked worse than he did in the Norton fight. Like, you know, I hate to, like, make light of this type of thing because you don't want to see a dude just take beatings like this. But, I mean, at least in the Norton fight, like, Bobic got punched in the throat, all right? If you and I get punched in the fucking throat, I don't know. I'm probably going to react like Bobic did and start flailing wildly with my face turning red as I'm gagging trying to go for air. So I understand why, you know, he was caught in the moment there and got knocked out, all right? Like, it would happen to the best of us. Anyone getting punched in the thorax is going to go wild for that one. But that didn't happen in the take fight. In the Tate fight, he just got hit with, like, 40 unanswered right hands in a row, you know? And if you watch it, man, it, it's so – I feel for Dwayne, but the dude moved like a fucking sloth. Like, he was maybe one of the slowest he, he fighters just I like, had. He just so – He just kind of, like, yeah. moves his head around but does it in a way where it's like, you're right there, punch. He, he what doesn't the fuck? He didn't have anything. He literally just uh, – uh, 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 And then all of a sudden – Tate was a stand-up fighter, you know what I mean? Just very basic. Nothing like that's going to make you stand out and be like, man, this guy is incredible. But he, everything, all of his fundamentals were just down. And that's what we, you know, when, when it comes to boxing, if you got your fundamentals down and really well pat, I mean, you're going to have some success, especially against a guy as ponderous as Bobbick. And so Tate started doing that, walking right in. Boom, boom, boom. Hitting him with like three jabs. All of a sudden, here comes the right hand. Wow. First one he gets hit with, Bobbick teeters a little bit. Gets hit with another one. Teeter some more. Hit with a third one. Then the trouble starts seeing. Like you said, Pat, what happens? The face starts, right? You see him, you know, the, the pained expression. He, he didn't have a poker face. You know what I mean? Like some guys, when they get hit, they get hurt. You can clearly see it. Arturo Gotti, for instance. Gotti didn't really mask his face when he got hurt, right? 
like you can tell when he was hurt. So like if you hit him in the body, you hit him in the face, and you can see sometimes he'd be like, and you know, back up. But Gotti would come back and kick your ass for that too. Bobic not so much. Once he got hurt, I mean, like it it was a it was thorough, man. Bobic made t- take that night look like Sonny Liston. He just got like smacked around so bad by right hands, and it and it he fought in a way where it was like he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know how to get away from him. He didn't. Yeah, it, it, you feel bad for him. Like it's funny, but you feel bad for him because oh, it's just he know. looks helpless. And it's crazy too because in the Norton fight, he was trained by uh he was trained by um uh, Eddie Futch, and he switched trainers after that one because he thought Futch wasn't really taking care of him and. You know, Fletch did have a lot of main fighters at that time, so maybe he was a little distracted. But he ends up training with uh, Murphy Griffith for this fight. Murphy Griffith was a longtime trainer, too, who had a lot of success with a lot of great fighters, uh, including Ray Mancini a few years afterwards. And Griffith couldn't do, I guess, you know, it's nothing worked there. So, but yeah, the way that Tate looked, man, spectacularly beating the shit out of Bobbick right there, like just knocking him around like a pinball. Definitely put his name on the map as a guy that's, you know, up and coming. Everyone's just like, oh, shit, like, okay, now I'm going to be taking, you know, uh, taking effect of this. So at this point, that was the beginning of 1979. And now we're in the heart of what was going to become the WBA tournament. So, And so, yeah, getting kind of back to where I was talking about, Saul Kirsner, a hotel magnate. Uh, basically a guy who had developed a bunch of these resorts around South Africa. And there was an ongoing, um, an ongoing assault on black people in South Africa, basically Um, something that, you know, people who pay attention to the news now are well aware of and familiar with. Um, Yeah basically people who are from a certain place being relocated being uh stuffed into a fairly small space so that it's there's a lot a ton of people uh, uh, to the point where it's squalid conditions in a very small space um and people are exploited their movement is uh monitored limited etc they're not actual citizens And this is what happened to black South Africans in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, not just starting then, of course, but Uh, this was. Apartheid was around for a minute, but yes, that was like. But this was when. Yes, absolutely. For a number of other political, ongoing political reasons in the country, Mm -hmm. it really came to a head in the late 1970s. And so there was a, an area called Bofuthatswana, which was supposed to be basically a designated homeland for black South Africans when in reality it was like a reservation. Like, you know, anybody who's uh, from the U.S. and is familiar with what happened to indigenous Americans knows what reservation is and knows what they're like or, you know, generally what they're like. And same thing, um, basically, and around this areas were uh, built these resorts where what was kind of sold was the idea that um, these resorts were to benefit black South Africans and that basically kind of, I mean, like reservations, I mean, you know, seriously, like uh, Native American casinos and shit, right? And so that these were supposed to go to black South Africans and that like blah, 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 and all this money was supposed to blah, blah, blah. But in reality, the vast majority of the money that these places were making and I swear this is not just a political thing I'm talking about. This goes toward the fight and it counts towards what we're talking about historically. Um, but the vast majority of what was being produced and the money and everything was leaving. It was not going to black South Africans. It was going to the white uh, investors and the people who lived in the suburbs. And like I was telling you, as an example, uh, Bofuthatswana had one of the biggest uh, power electrical power plants in South Africa, where it produced, I think, the most electricity in South Africa, and more than 75% of it was being pumped out elsewhere and not used in Bofuthatswana, and less than 25% of black Africans in Bofuthatswana had electricity, and even fewer had running water. And so the, the conditions were terrible, absolutely terrible. 
and they were being exploited as workers and servers and all those sorts of things uh, at these resorts. And it was you know, like they were treated like, oh, you know, we're Walmart and we're giving you all these jobs, but treating you like shit and not paying you fucking a thing. And so and the point was that this was extremely controversial when the rest of the world caught wind of it and mm -hmm. figured out that black South Africans were being exploited and that this was an entire industry. This wasn't just, you know, an isolated incident. And so we've talked about this before, like we said on the Sun City episode, where a number of artists and celebrities and actors and musicians banded together and was like, fuck this. Don't go to South Africa. Don't play Sun City. Don't don't patronize these places because black South Africans are not getting this money like this. is They're you know, they're not getting this. Uh, and so in any case, you would think that it would be the kind of place where if you're a business person, you stay the fuck away. You don't get involved in this shit. Not if you're Bob Arum or Don King, for that matter. You you look at this as an opportunity. You seize the fucking day. This is boxing, bro. Yeah, you seize the mother. This, you, this is Dubai. It's yeah. Saudi Arabia. You know what I'm saying? Exact same thing. So exactly, history always repeats itself in the sport, doesn't it? Yeah, we ain't surprised. We know how this works. So here we are. You know, Bob Arum's friends with Saul Kirsner. Uh, like I was saying, Bob Arum pays. Muhammad Ali, $400,000 to get the WBA title. And basically, he now has control of a heavyweight championship. Uh, Don King, who is very good friends with uh, Jose Suleiman, who is the head of the WBC at the time, uh, you know, in effect, controls the WBC. And so you know, here you have these dueling heavyweight titles or whatever. And so in any case like you were talking about earlier, Bob Arum helps set up this WBA tournament to determine a new WBA champion. He wants John Tate in on this because he signs John Tate. Uh, and like I was telling you, and I started to say, John Tate was, he was uneducated. Yeah. He didn't know how to read. He didn't write very well to the point where when he signed a contract with Bob Arum, according to reports, he signed an X because he didn't crazy. know how he didn't know how to sign his own name. He didn't even know how to print it, nothing. So he signed X on the contract, according to reports. And so... Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Look into that however you will. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people might say, ah, well, you know, he knew what he was going to do or whatever. I don't know. You can view it however you want, but this is how this whole thing started, and this is how John Tate kind of entered into this tournament. Uh, Harry Kutsea... Kali Knutza, you wanted in, you know, in to kind of get in uh, to this action too, because you desperately wanted the white South African heavyweights to either end up as the heavyweight champions or at least to kind of be a gateway to exploit this locale. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it was an interesting lot that he, that he built up for this one. So you had Kali Knutza who out of the two heavyweights, Harry Kutsia and Kali Kondosa, he was much more of the more controversial one for a, for a number of reasons, and deservedly so, because obviously the dude was not a good person. I'm sorry. Like, it's just, you know, he was a trigger-happy apartheid cop who um, gained notoriety. I hate to use that word, but you know what I mean. He gained a lot of infamy. That's the right word to use. Infamy for, what was he, shot a young black youth who he felt, he said he was threatened because the kid, uh, you said he flashed a black power sign to him or something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. He during a riot during one of the apartheid riots at the time, mm -hmm. he shot a uh, a young black kid running away in the leg. Yeah, and like you know, made the kid. Yeah, obviously injured him, and you know, kept and all that stuff. So and yeah, and no then one... he threatened witnesses with violence when they tried to speak out against him. That was the second thing. Yeah. It's just a piece of shit. So, um, but he he made for fun fights, and Aaron wants to explain him because he was popular. He actually was very popular in South Africa as a fighter, and he scores that big knockout of Dwayne Bobick, and again, that's a big name for himself. And then Aaron wants to bring him to America, so they set up a fight with him in Miami Beach, and against our old friend Bill Sharkey, who we covered on a previous episode. And um, that created a lot of controversy and a half in itself. That was a big, big, big issue where they weren't even sure if that wasn't going to come up because 
all the, you know, remember how we said in the late seventies, these groups started coming out and realizing the exploitation that was going on out there and all the bullshit that's happening in South Africa. They're realizing their number one son, their, you know, their, their best fighter right now is coming over here and we're going to pay him and let him profit on this. <laughs> that shit is not going to be flying. So that created a big stick. And um, the fight did end up coming off. He, he stopped Bill Sharkey in four rounds. And I mean, that's not the big, like Sharkey was a good fighter and we talked about him on the show and like he was tough and would willing to fight anybody, but he was an undersized heavyweight, like very, very. He was more just a scary person. <laughs> yes. Dude, you did not want to cross in the alleyway, but if you got him one-on-one -on -one in the ring and you were bigger than him and stronger than him, you had probably were going to beat him, but whatever. So that's what Knutso was building himself to. Tate had just won that fight, like you said, against um, uh, Dwayne Bobbick. And so now this fight is going to happen, all right? And it was aired on, what, was it aired on NBC? It was where it aired on one of the channels. But it wasn't aired, like, they aired it live, but they were doing it from the studio. The announcers weren't there live. And I feel like it was Tim, it was oh, Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy. I think it was Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy. Almost positive. I think, I think you might be right, but I'm not so If it was Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy, what was that, CBS? I could see it. I think so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and live from Mabato, South Africa, and um, at the resort, wherever, you know, over there. And um, if you look at the, if you look at the crowd, 99% of white, you like, Tate was definitely going into hostile territory that night. And um, it, it's a fun fight to watch. It's on YouTube. I'm sure people that listen to the show have probably seen it in the past or maybe watched it live if you're old enough. But um, it was a fight that like Kanutsa in his wild brawling style that again, that's what made for fun TV came out there, he's tried one end strong, went brawling through, blah, 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 blah. But he was wearing himself out. He, it wasn't, this wasn't Bill Sharkey, all right? This wasn't Dwayne Bobbick. This wasn't going to be the shell of Joe Frazier, who he was scheduled to fight at one point. Do you remember that? Yeah. Frazier and, and a few of his aborted comebacks before he fought jo uh, Jumbo Cummings in 81. One of them was supposed to be against Cali Kanetsa. Another one was supposed to be against Ernie Shavers. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, how those fights would have ended up. I'm pretty sure Shavers would have decapitated Frazier at that point. And I hate to say it, but Knutza probably would have beat Frazier too at that point. But whatever. Anyways, back to the fight. Um, Knutza, you know, he wears himself out. Tate also too. Like, again, he's unspectacular in how he watches, but he knows how to fight. Like, he's very st – he stands up kind of straight like a European fighter, but everything was so compact with him. He had a good jab. He had a good right hand. He threw in combination. And he knew how to go to the body, too, even though he wasn't, like, bending out. He knew how to throw nice uppercuts to the body and stuff. So, like, he broke Knutza down, started beating the shit out of him. By the time, like, round eight or whatever it was when the fight got stopped, Knutza was just a spent bullet. He didn't go down, but he was getting knocked around like a double end bag. And rightfully so. It was pretty prominent to see Tate do that. And immediately, Tate becomes, you know, a hero to the black South Africans because he just beat one of their, you know, public enemy number one. So on the other side of the pond, Leon Spinks, who you mentioned, gets brought into the tournament because there's only, right after that, he's just fresh off a of loss of Ali and still popular and, like, you know, at, probably favored out of the whole group to make it to the finals, if anything, if not right outright win it. And um, he gets blasted shockingly in one round by Harry Cosia. Cosia, by this point, again, it was an unknown name. Like, you know, if you watched, the, if you read the magazines and looked at the ratings, you would have an idea of maybe who he was just by reading about him, but you never really saw anything of him. I mean, this is 1979. How much footage out there was of them? You know what I mean? But did he already have surgery by this point, Pat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the bionic hand was in good use at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had, he'd broken it like a whole bunch of times. Before then, right? Okay. So Spinks, who I'm going to guess was probably on some kind of bender too, man. The dude was, this was the prime of his life of being a wild child. And he still had a lot of name and, and light to his name. So, you know, he was out and about. But gets blasted in one round. Shockingly, this was a big upset. It was a very, very big upset at the time. And the announcers even show it as so because, like, Sphinx comes out rampaging, rah, 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 you know, doing his same windmill attack. Kosia just kind of rides it out. Boop, boop, bop. Drops him. Gets up again. Boop, right hand. Before you know it, Sphinx is there half drooling on the canvas and seeing stars. And it's like, whoa, Okay. So it brings it to this big fight now. And now Aram is salivated because he has the white South African champ and, bought, and John Tate that he can build in South Africa for the WBA heavyweight championship. Yeah, from, from his perspective, it's like win-win because he's like one way or another, I'm going to have one of the white South Africans in the final and we got a 50-50 shot, you know what I mean? So 
that's I, I could see that being viewed that way for for sure but actually something really interesting too um like i i mean it's it's somewhat weird ground to tread and i don't want to you know how much of john tate's like you know lack of education you know was his circumstance and you know how much of it had to do with him starting fighting or uh, who knows i i really have no idea what was going through his head and all that type of stuff but what was fairly clear was that when it came to the politics of what was going on in south africa mm -hmm. john tate sounded like he really didn't want anything to do with it and neither did harry kutsia for that matter Absolutely, uh, I'm going to say that. Kotsia was a very humble guy, quiet, unassuming, and um, a guy like who would come a few years later, um, Brian Mitchell, Hall of Fame junior lightweight champion. Just unfortunately, a product of their circumstance. Not they you know they don't believe in what was happening over there, <laughs> and they were and they uh, get like uh, or you go way way back, um, Max Schmelin. You know what I mean? But they're just aligned with it because of where they're from. Right. And and they are playing into it, whether they mean to or not. But sure. nonetheless, you know they're part of it. And but that being said, uh, you know the the politics of the situation was definitely complex because I was reading an article, um, an article from right around the Kanutsa fight after the Kanutsa fight that was interviewing a bunch of Black South Africans and asking about John Tate and like, you know, what do you think about John Tate? And almost every single one of them was like, fuck John Tate. We don't yeah. give a fuck about John Tate because barely any of us were there or even allowed there to go watch it. Because like you said, you look out into the audience and there were, there were black spectators, but they're segregated. And it was an extremely small percent. I think they said it was less than 5%. And, um, and basically, the when they asked the black South Africans, they basically were like, well, we don't have anything against him. It's just who the fuck is he? What is nothing's changing? So what? And there were a couple of people that were like, oh, you know, that might be some hope that, you know, now in the future uh, that, you know, black South Africans might have more participation and this or that. But for the most part, they didn't really seem to care. Although I think that the idea that John Tate's win over Kanutsu was a big inspiration for black South Africa's is a, it's a nicer story and it's sure. definitely easier for most of boxing media to latch onto. You know what I mean? Like it's easier for them to be like, Absolutely. look at this guy. They're all the black South Af Africans are going to look up to him. And we, they love that story when in rea the reality of the situation is that he didn't really change anything and that not, not through, he didn't, you know, he's not trying to hurt anybody, but it's also, I think that a lot of people also saw that one, he was fighting over there when a lot of people were saying, what the fuck are you doing? Larry Holmes, for instance, was one of the fighters who publicly came out and was bashing John Tate and calling him a, a dummy and call him an idiot and all sorts of shit like that. And I mean, like, I think he called Holmes him was doing that about everybody back then. That's, that's true. <laughs> and he did call people worse than the R word. Cause I'm pretty sure he did call John Tate an R word, like, and you know, the, the R slur, but that being said, he and like you and like you and I both know, he said way worse about other fighters too. Oh boy, just you know, guys, if you really if you really want to look into it, just find an early '80s at, uh, magazine. I don't we love Larry it, Holmes, but, but I'm just saying he was a there, salty there, motherfucker. There are some interviews with Larry Holmes using very questionable language back then that was printed because back then that questionable language was still allowed to be printed. That's all I'm yeah, gonna say. They didn't even <laughs> care at all. But, but like, like if uh, I was put on in 2023 today. He, oh my god, <laughs> there was some stuff, dude. Yeah, there was some stuff. If you think that somebody saying they want to catch a body is wild in like 2022, 2023, just, just, go, just back we'll go back and look at the transcripts of Larry Holmes' interviews from 1979 and 1980. All right, you but, want some shit, <laughs> but so, I mean, you know, it, but that being absolutely. said, you know, uh. John, a lot of people were, like I said, not too happy with John Tate because he was going over there and fighting in the first place, mm -hmm. which was bad. Uh, and then on top of that, he was doing it and not saying anything. He was doing it and not going over there and addressing anything. He wasn't one way or the other. He basically, he wasn't going like, ah, oh, apartheid's bad or apartheid's good. He was just kind of like, nah, I don't want any part in this, which is a, a bitchy way to do it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of cowardly. And so he he got a lot of shit for that, and he was uh, considered kind of a pawn in the situation, which in a lot of ways he was, uh, unwittingly in some ways and perhaps wittingly in others. But 
it was a big win. Uh, and on top of that, he didn't really have very many pro fights. You know, like he he kind of shot pretty quickly toward the front of this WBA pack, and that uh, the wins over Dwayne Bobick and Cali Kunitsa, you know, knocking off two kind of top rated white heavyweights that were, you know, considering this political situation, garnered a lot of newspaper space, man, and it was big, huge, and. Even though Tate wasn't the most articulate guy and you know, he struggled in interviews and stuff like that, he had a personality. He really did. You know what I mean? Everyone he said he had a great him. smile. Super he did. Warm I mean, guy. You saw that smile, man. That thing was a megawatt 24 carat, gorgeous smile. Like, very, very big. You can tell he had a southern charm where he wanted to be friendly with everybody. You know, he wore the cowboy hat and all the whole thing. And Ring Magazine, you know, kind of played it. Like, other magazines played it up. Like, Tate had a good image, all right? He was sponsored by Adidas. And we've talked about boxing sponsorships before, even on the show and outside the show with our friends and stuff. And like to get a sponsorship back then, you know, it was a big deal. Even today to get a big deal. And Tate, um, I believe was sponsored by Adidas because you see all the trunks he was always wearing, the shirts and his corner and stuff like that. Like he, you know, he was rocking with them. And again, coming out of the 76 Olympics and all this other stuff, like he, you know, Larry Holmes obviously had the better pedigree. Larry Holmes had the better resume. Larry Holmes was the legitimate champion when all comes down to it. But we've talked about this before. Holmes, you know, well, first he was aligned with Don King and Aaron was already kind of like, whatever about that. He had his own champion he could deal with. And Holmes was just a bitter, you know, a bitter dude. Like he was, you know, complaining about all these injustices happening to him and he's going through this and that. And aside from Ernie Shavers, his early, his early, um, title defense record showed you how barren the heavyweight division was in the late seventies and early eighties, Alfredo invent, uh, invest Alicia, um, Ozzy Ocasio, you know, Leroy Jones, Scott Ledoux, um, what's the Lorenzo Zanon. I mean, that's, there was not much going on in 1980 when it comes to terms of that. You know what I mean? So Aaron realized what he had in Tate and he realized he had a star on the rise. And he still had an ear with Muhammad Ali, who was looking to make a comeback because Ali was getting bored being, you know, uh, a, a toy, as he called it, for Jimmy Carter going around trying to play diplomat or whatever and just making public appearances. He missed being in the ring. He missed, you know, the adulation. He missed being called champion and just being the, the head of the game. So when Ali was thinking about making a comeback in the 1979 going into 1980, his first, um, his first target was not Larry Holmes. It was John Tate. He was ready to fight Tate. You know what I mean? That was the whole plan that was going to go on. Aram obviously he was had, ready to fight him in South Africa too. Um, anyway, yeah, absolutely. Like he was, you know, that was like a big deal. <laughs> Crazily, and, you know, it is. It's, it's funny how things work that way. But like that, that was the whole plan. Aram was going to do that. Um, Tate was supposed to make three million to fight Ali, and it was all basically set. The only thing John Tate had to do was get by old Larry Holmes' victim, but a guy who was definitely coming into his own a little bit, Mike Weaver. A tough guy, you know what I mean? But he, the thing is, Holmes beat him, but Holmes went life and death with him when Weaver was, what, like, nine, 18 and 9, 29, something like that, you know what I mean? And Holmes almost got stopped. He got knocked around the ring left and right before he landed that miracle uppercut, uppercut that took Weaver out. And Bob Arum had, you know, the idea, kind of like, I think... Years later, he tried to do the same thing when Raul Marquez, for instance, lost to... Remember Raul Marquez beat Keith Mullins? And Mullins, you know, sliced his face up all kinds of nasty ways and lost a controversial decision. Okay, Terry Norris now. Let's put him in with Keith Mullins because Norris is going to fight Oscar De La Hoya after this. And then Mullins comes into his own and knocks De La Hoya out. So, you know, Tate, this is his first defense. He's going to fight Mike Weaver. And the, the consensus is, okay, we're going to put this in Knoxville in his hometown, you know I me mean, in front of his adoring fans. And if Tate can whip Weaver a lot easier than Holmes did, that'll put him at the forefront. Oh, this is the real champion. Then all, all roads ahead to Ali. And for the most part, Tate was looking beautiful in that fight. You know what I mean? He's punching in combination. He's landing to the body. Weaver is a little bit more listless than he was in the Holmes fight and just kind of plodding along and following along. But he's a tough-ass guy. You know what I mean? This isn't the same Weaver who in the beginning of his career lost to Dwayne and Rodney Bobbick, the type of guy that only took fights if he needed groceries or to pay a bill. Like this was a Weaver who was taking his shit seriously at that point and coming into his own. And even though he was losing and plodding along, he was still coming and coming and coming. 
Round 12 should have been an idea what could possibly happen because that was the round he hurt Tate. What's up, Cap? And um, so he hurts him. And, like, you know, you remember that. I forgot it was either a hook or a right hand, but Tate definitely got shaken to his boots and clinched on and rode it out. But that was, like, the only instance of, like, oh, shit. Other than that, he was, you know, for the most part, getting outboxed. And um, Tate was, you know, commanding a victory in front of his hometown. And then round 15 started. And all Tate has to do is stand on for three minutes, and he got this. You know what I mean? Weaver's corner is imploring him. You need to knock this man out. You need to do something like enough is enough. You know, pull some Rocky shit out of you. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's a minute and 54 into the round. Tate just drops as he's on the ropes. You know, he's probably a little bit tired and everything like that. And then Weaver just cracks out a fucking left hook from the gods. What happens, Pat? Timber. Oh, man. It's a nasty knockout. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Like, it's it's especially bad, especially at the time. Yeah. This was the first instance. So after John Tate defeats Harry Kutze, you know, he becomes the WBA champion. Uh, or, uh, by winning the vacant title, um, which in and of itself, you know, is pretty crazy. But he did basically what any, what the vast majority of champions who become champion out of nowhere do. They go home and they become famous and just love becoming famous, you know. But the thing with John Tate was that he was generally wearing opponents down, if nothing else. Like he was outworking them. Like you said, nothing spectacular. He wasn't super skilled, didn't have a ton of power, but he he was wearing down opponents. And then in the Mike Weaver fight, it was like kind of the opposite where Weaver just wouldn't stop coming at him. And John Tate was doing well for the most part, but then you could see Weaver just kind of closing the gap, closing the gap, closing the gap. And then finally in the last round, John Tate became the first heavyweight champion. And of course, you know, we, we know the title splits. So he's not the heavyweight champion, but he became the first heavyweight champion to lose the title and be ahead in the last round, the very first heavyweight champion to, for that to happen. Um, and I mean, you know, dude was a large guy and just gets slumped. Like you can, one. you almost don't even see it, you know, like, cause his backs to the camera in the live shot and you could see, you know, Weaver kind of, you know, do this and like do the motion, but you don't really see Tate. You just see him just slump and then like lifeless, like, just, just crash to the the down his absolute pancake batter. He just splatters. And he's and I, useless. Like he can't get I up. I forgot the no commentator's name. Um, it was, it was a famous commentator who was calling that fight, but he had the great call. Laugh, talk. Left hook, <laughs> you know, like yells it. Take us down away. You know, like he. It was a great call. And Weaver has always has always been a favorite of mine for his post fight celebrations because he always went over the top when he would win. He was so happy you couldn't help but like the guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and when Weaver won that fight, he almost knocked himself out too, if you remember, because he goes crazy. He goes for a backflip. And then midair decides that it's not going to happen, and just and he still and just got else, like yeah. he just and just drops and it's like, you know, <laughs> drops on his back, takes a a back bump that would that would make great yeah. Back that bump. wasn't no wrestling ring. That wasn't. Oh. That's, that's not the same. So I said he took a back bump that would make Greg Valentine proud, and just slap. And then he gets you know smiles with a bloody mouthpiece in there. It's, so you see the scene of Tate laying there unconscious, and then you see Weaver, you know, spread out with his arms out, laying on the. Someone at the side of him. And um, yeah, that was, you know, as happy as you could be for Weaver that you had to feel for Tate because that was a nasty knockout in front of his hometown. And he lost it with only like less than a minute left in the fight. That's really, really hard to come by. And, um, you know, and he lost that opportunity because, you know, history has changed at that point. Who knows what would have happened? If he had fought Ali, he probably would have beat Ali. You know, Ali was... A spent bullet at that point and it's it's crazy because he lost all of that ali wasn't interested in fighting weaver you know they they talked about it a little bit but I, you know he turned his attention to holmes and we all know what happened from there but tate now you know mike weaver's the wba champion and tate now is just kind of like well what are you gonna do like we gotta we gotta build you back up so now it's 1980 um and he's gonna fight and now at 1980 it's like, okay, what, what the hell is going to happen here? And, you know, six months into the year, 
he gets the he gets the undercard slot on the Sugar Ray Leonard Roberto Duran card against Trevor Burbick. And you know, it's another fight, bro. But it's like the backstory to this one, it makes sense why they made that fight. All right. Burbick at this point, yes, he was a 76 Olympian as long with Tate, but Burbick had a weird story that like he just kind of got to like shot up. Like, cause he was the only person, like, um, fucking heavyweight from he, he represented Jamaica, correct? In the I Olympics, think so. yeah. And how many how many amateur boxers did Jamaica ever really send? Look. Out? Yeah, 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 Jamaica. How many how many amateur boxers do Jamaica actually send out to like various tournaments? Let alone have a heavyweight. You know what I mean? So a guy with Burbick with limited experience was definitely going to be fighting all these guys and losing to them. Like he lost to Mike Dope, he lost to Michael Dokes twice, he lost to other heavyweights. Like you know. Yeah, he had a worse record than anticipated as an amateur. Didn't matter. And then he turned pro. It was just on the Canadian scene. Even tried to fight George Chavallo at one point. Um, shows you how long Chavallo was around. And um, his claim to f- his two biggest fights, he got knocked out in one round by Bernardo Mercado. And he fought a draw with Leroy Caldwell, who was a journeyman heavyweight that if you were going to go anywhere, you probably were going to beat him. So, yes, this was a safe bet, most people thought, when you know he was going to fight um, John Tate as a safe comeback opponent. But the backstory here is from, I think I read it in Jack Newfield's book and it's been reported elsewhere else too, but like, you know, Aram and King were working together on the show. Obviously they're bitter enemies, but they're going to try to do well for whatever, for the case of this. Right. And as working as co-promoters, what they're supposed to do is they're going to split the undercards in terms of like, who was going to, you know, match make and do stuff like that. Right. And I think, who was it? Bobby Goodman or Al Brave, Al Braveman? One of those, I mean, Al Braveman, Goodman, one of those guys where they called up, I want to say, um, who was the matchmaker for top rank at that time? Teddy Brenner, probably? Probably, yeah. Yeah, because I know Brenner left MSG and got with top rank in the late 70s, early 80s, so maybe. And Brenner, I think, or whoever he talked to was like very like, you know, in an asshole way, was like, ha, ha, we already fixed everything up. You know, the undercar's all set. You ain't gonna do shit, ha. And like basically blocked King from doing anything, which got them annoyed. And so they're like, okay. So they were looking through the list. Oh, who's Trevor Burbick? Okay. And they picked, they found, oh, Trevor Burbick's gonna fight, you know, um, John Tate. So they plucked Burbick. They, they put him up in like the best amenities, I guess, for like top training put him in with good sparring partners, did this, did that. Like, they just made sure this dude was in tip-top shape, right? <laughs> well, Tate wasn't. By all accounts, um, from the article I sent you, Pat, Tate was married at this point, correct? Yes. So, yeah, Tate was married, and his wife, I think she was like a local beauty pageant queen, something like that, and his wife um, put him on a diet called Scarsdale Diet. I think it was or something something like that. So some like all carb diet, which is like yeah, some, it was uh, like a ridiculous what? diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not meant to, it, it was a fucked up diet. Uh, one of those things that like these fighters who don't know any better, like Ali taking Thylor before fighting Holmes, you know, they just go along with it because they don't think anything of it. You know what I mean? Okay. And then like just, three oh, months later they go into the hospital because their kidney is not working or some shit. Or some crazy shit like that, right? So if there was going to be a recipe for an upset, it was going to be this night because, like, King's people plucked Burbick and, like, you know, got him to become in the superhuman shape, the best shape of his life. While we didn't know at the time, but John Tate just, you know, he was, he was being distracted. He was on this weird diet. And I think when he went to Montreal, they said he went to, like, a local fried chicken shack that he frequented during the Olympics and kind of gorged himself there, which certainly didn't help things. And so um, during the fight, you know, Tate does well enough in the first few rounds. It's a bruising fight, but Burbick in his weird mauling windmill, awkward caveman clubbing thing is clearly getting to Tate. And Tate is each round is looking much more, you know, each round he's looking much more uncomfortable than the previous one. I mean, he's still doing, he's still working in there. Like he was, you know, landing, he had a decent body attack and he landed a couple of punches, rock Burbick once or twice, but he, you can just see like there's like m- mounding and mounding pressure on, on Tate. And then by uh, what, what what round did he get stopped in? It was I think the ninth, ninth or something. Yeah, you're right, the ninth round eight. That's when you really start seeing like you know the change in momentum and Burbick working and blah blah blah. And it's between round eight and round nine. That's the scene where you're just like, holy shit! Because in one corner you see Burbick, he's standing up between rounds now. 
he is like really, you know, he's feeling himself. He's all hyped up. His trainers are yelling. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like slapping his chest. And then you look across the ring, you see Tate. Tate looks bewildered. He looks disheveled. He looks hurt. He looks confused. And he just doesn't look like he really wants to fight anymore. And he's just kind of like, you know, he, he's in disarray. They shove him off. And he doesn't even throw a punch, man. It's one of the most saddest, surreal things you ever see because, like, Burbick comes and rushes him, throws a couple of punches, and Tate literally runs, runs across the ring. Like, I've never really seen anything like that before or since. Like, not, not something quite like that. He literally runs across the ring with Burbick chasing him behind wildly. And Burbick just swinging these, like, clubs. And he catches one on the side of the head, then he catches one in the back of the head. And then he just drops face first again, unconscious, the way he did in the, in the, in the Weaver fight. And then, but the problem is, at this point, unlike the Weaver fight, now his leg is twitching uncontrollably, kind of like Ingemar Johansson in the second Patterson fight. And his leg is twitching, and he's laying there. And then you see Burbick stand over him. Gap! Gap! You know, yelling at him like, Ali over, listen, gap, you sucker! And then getting pushed away. And then he's getting counted out. And as he gets counted out, if you watch closely, you'll see uh, the back view and you see Don King jumping up hysterically over and over cheering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got one yeah. over the apostle apartheid. Exactly. And then who was it? Um, George Kimball, who wrote the, the wonderful book, Three Kings, and obviously was ringside for this fight, turned around and said, don't tell me you have him too. And King smiled. I do. Ha, ha. Just had to give him the thumbs up. Like, yeah, 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 he's mine. <laughs> And that was the beginning of the end for John Tate in terms of, uh, you know, his boxing career, really at the top. Yeah, I mean. That was the end of him at the top, actually. No, I, no it definitely was the end. Because, I mean, like, he fought, gosh, I don't know how many, 20 more times, that 15, 20 more times after that. But, you know, there were a couple of fighters that are recognizable, but nobody, like, good. You know, like, nobody, nobody ranked. Nobody who was really going to push back. You know, the aforementioned Leroy Caldwell uh, Donnie Long, just mostly a bunch of kind of also ran type of fighters who were second raiders at best. And it was at this point where, you know, he was starting to get into trouble outside the ring. And he was like, you know, there was like issues of, um, you know, motivation and like, you know, he was getting caught up in like rumors of drug use and this and that, alcohol abuse with him roaming the streets of Knoxville. There was a lot of stories coming out at that point. But like you said, he was being active and winning, but it was against very nondescript opposition. And when you had two best wins over are over a Leroy Caldwell, who, again, had been in there with everybody, but that's the minute, it's the early 80s now, and he's at his last rope. And Donnie Long, who would go on to be, you know, a Mike Tyson uh, wreckage victim um, in early in his career. I'm not sure how, you know, that constitutes as you getting a potential title shot. But in 1984, somehow, some way, he was scheduled to fight Larry Holmes for the IBF title. I mean, I'm not like shocked, really, but I, you know, it's because I mean, of can... course not, considering now that we know about the IBF and sanctioned bodies to begin with, but it's just kind of like Jesus Christ. <laughs> and how, you know, how title shots and those kinds of things can be finagled fairly easily. But I mean, for crying out loud dude you know just fucking nuts but i that's how it works you know you just need to string together some wins even if they're not necessarily against anybody all that good and you're bound to get recognized by one of the sanctioning bodies who are desperate for whatever but um yeah like you said one of the big issues was that john tate kept going in and out of trouble and um we've talked about this countless times especially on the true crime type of shows that we've done I, I obviously can't relate. I've never been a pro fighter. I've never been like a champion or anything, but I think that it's just a story that we see all the time when a lot of fighters who especially come from places where before they were nobody or before where they, you know, they kind of rose to fame out of nowhere. It's the kind of thing where like you're, you're like a bar owner or something mm -hmm. and you're totally willing to comp alcohol or pay a couple hundred bucks, whatever it is to get the former champ to hang out at your establishment because that might bring some more business, you know, and, and places in Knoxville. like town, yeah, it's places like local towns, like Knoxville and things Knoxville, like Knoxville, people were down for that shit, you know, mm -hmm. go hang out with the champ. And, you know, unfortunately, John Tate got sucked into 
the same things that got their hooks into so many others in the 1980s got their hooks into John Tate too, alcohol and cocaine. And, you know, he lost himself in those worlds, uh, by all accounts was a nice guy and a good guy pretty much the whole way. But those are the kind of demons that are, you know, they don't really respect whether or not you're a nice person. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, well, it's, in- I'll, I'll mention this too. The, the Holmes fight was supposed to be a dual part deal with these new promoters that, that were trying to get into boxing. And Holmes was willing to work with them because anytime Holmes saw some money to be made, he would be willing to it. And so the deal was he fights John Tate first and he was going to do the unification with Harry Cotsia. And that's what was supposed to happen. And remember, we've seen posters. Have been pretty, there's a lot of posters on eBay of the Holmes Cotsia fight that was supposed to happen and obviously failed to happen because this new star promoter who, you know, all these dudes who come in with money. And always think these grandiose plans and be like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and blah, blah, blah. And then they like, realize- we do like our own episodes of our show about these fools. And yeah. then it's like in 2022, some new Jack comes in and is like, look at who, look at this new TV deal we got with bounce app, something, something. And we're just laughing. going, What? It's like history repeating itself TV. over and over and over it's again. Just that bounce was ridiculous, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's just that. All the, you know, when you just think back on times, you got dudes like Sylvester Stallone and Tiger Ride promotion, Magic Johnson trying to get into boxing, all these different opponent wars back in the day. Oh, we're going to do this now. I'm going to look out for the fighters. And blah, 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 blah. You know, the closest. And, and, like, and, and big time actors taking, yes. you know, Tatum O'Neill taking stakes in, you know, uh, in fighters and stuff like that, trying to manage them. And also, it's all, yeah. you know. The only guy that ever really worked out, I think, in terms of like being. Uh, working in the tele i mean there's a bunch of people but like the, the most recent i could think of that like did well in the television industry but like did well by their fighter was um the co-writer what was the, the co-writer of the simpsons that he was with uh layman brewster oh yeah i can't remember that dude's name but you know he passed away but you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah um yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember his name, but I know who you're talking about. But yeah, he did well by Brewster, and he was, you know, he was a like he was knowledgeable enough and didn't try to like get too involved in nothing. Like he constantly, yeah, whatever. But the, that being said, like it, you know, it was for the best because this is 1984. What the hell is John Tate going to do fighting Larry Holmes in '84? All right, Holmes at that point was slowed down a bit, sure, but like Tate was. All right, there's not a lot of footage of John Tate post the Burbick fight, if any, besides his last fight, which happened in 1988. But by all accounts, you know, this was not going to end well for Tate. Like, he was in a whole <laughs> – you know, Holmes was even displaced in the mid-'80s at that point. But, like, Tate was different, definitely from a different time period, a different atmosphere. And, like, the way the heavyweight division was changing at this point in 84, you know, you had guys like Witherspoon and others who were already there and – <clears throat> only in a few very sh- uh, short uh, in less than a year Mike Tyson was going to be on the scene and you know the whole landscape was going to change at that point too what was John Tate going to do during that time you know like just so his final bout his final professional fight is yeah. in 1988 right against Noel Quarles, yeah and that's on YouTube I think in you London. can find very yeah. grainy footage of it on there. Yeah. And he, yeah. oh my God, it's bad, man. Tate is so out of shape. He's waddling around the ring. He's big. He's fleshy. He's just, it's, it's sad to see, man. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty bad fall. So here's a, a brief chronology, like a summed up chronology of the shit that he got into after his, his last professional fight, July, 1990 arrested for allegedly selling cocaine may 15th 1991 arrested for failing to show up for trial on drug charge may 20th 1991 five days later two years suspended sentence on drug charge uh june 1991 arrested for public intoxication and drug possession july 1991 sentenced to time served and freed from jail september 91 uh intensive supervision for violating probation January 92, accused of robbing and beating a man. March 92, jailed after probation revoked. November 92, freed after promising to obey court rules. December 1992, jailed for violating probation. 
February 94, he sued uh, Knox County uh, in in Tennessee over allegedly falling in jail. Uh, 96, arrested on theft charges. And then finally, 98 is the last time we hear from this young man. So, yeah, it was the theft charges, I think, were stealing cinder blocks. And he was getting into just the the dumbest shit. Like, in unfortunately, he got fucked over by the city of Knoxville, dude, because it almost became like a cottage industry, like capping on John Tate, like in the in the newspapers and shit. And they're making him sound like he was like a criminal mastermind. Oh, it was yeah, you know. And Ace Miller and these others were always talking. Like they would hear stories and they and then the articles they would write that would just make him seem so bad. John Tate's arrested for this. He's arrested for that. Oh, he broke a man's jaw and he stole fifteen dollars from him. He did this and he like it was you know he went through a lot. Don't 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 get me wrong. Like yeah, I'm I mean, not yeah, I'm not defending anything he did. It's just that I think not. that a he lot went, of it looks fell. really looks really low level shit. You know absolutely. But like we talked about this before the show started. You know, a guy like him who was clearly sensitive and went through a lot of stuff and was like, he, he shot to the top really quickly and got dropped down just as quickly. You know, when you are a hero to the people of Knoxville and then you almost become ridiculed and made fun of by them. It's easy, you know, mentally, I guess it's easy to fall. Like it's just, you know, there was a lot of stuff he had to go through. Again, I'm not defending anything he did because he was a knucklehead. Absolutely. So, and people will call him out on that. You know, a lot of his closest people that didn't turn their back on him would tell him, yo, you are not a stupid individual. Like, you're a smart guy. Like, you can do better than this. You can be in the gym and train people. Like, we'll try to help you. Like, do something for yourself. And they almost, like, I don't know. I forgot which one quoted this. But there was, like, he almost just wanted to be a bum. Like, he just enjoyed being that. Like, he just wanted to be a professional, like, loser. And, you know, what I was getting at before, too, like, we talked about before the show. Well, one of the things that I can't even imagine going through this he would be out in public or at a bar or anywhere else. And from kids all the way to adults, be like, you're big John Tate. And he would smile and say, yes. And then they would collapse and lay there unconscious. Like it was him. Like, cause they were making fun of him getting knocked out, you know? And by all accounts, usually he would just sit there and smile and, you know, keep on going or whatever. But like for myself, if I was a former heavyweight champion and I was at a bar one day and a guy came up to me and did that, I'm sorry, man, but like a dude whose diet consists of boilermakers, a uh, uh, bologna sandwich, and a fucking pack of Marlboros is not going to do get that over me. I'm knocking his dentures loose that night immediately. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. After like the fifth time, I would have been like, <laughs> no, yeah. fuck. Yeah. Like I'm giving laughing. you the smoke and everyone else in the bar just on principle. <laughs> Like what the fuck, dude? Because you ain't gonna get that me. If I'm not gonna be the heavyweight champion of the world, I'm gonna be the uh, heavyweight champion of my local eight ball time. But, fuck. but you know, unfortunately, part of it, and I'm not trying to go back and play like psychiatrist, you know, after the fact. But it sounded like he probably was suffering from depression, dude, because he yeah, he he straight up said too when he. So he had people around the Knoxville community that like you know kind of looked after him from time to time or saw him every couple of years, you know, cause they would run into him. Unfortunately, the, his last handful of years were spent on the street or if not on the street, you know, basically in shelters and stuff like that. And, um, you know, but when he got out of jail, the last time he saw one of those people and they're like, God damn, you know, you got big, what happened? And he, he remarked to him, Hey man, I knocked out more fools in the prison chow line than I ever did right. in a boxing ring you know, and shit like that. And then one of the last, one of the last things, unfortunately, uh, you know, a couple of days before his passing, one of the last things that wound up happening was he was at a homeless shelter. Um, and basically he had gained so much weight that he just kept going through the chow line. Like he went, he went up to get food at a homeless shelter. He went up to get food and he ate all his food and then he got back in line and some little old lady who was serving food got in his face and was like, get the fuck, what the fuck, dude? You know, you're getting seconds and people haven't even gotten first yet. What the fuck are you doing? And he got kicked out of line and like kicked out of the shelter temporarily because he was just, you know, he wasn't like causing trouble, but that was the kind of trouble, you know, just he was like a big galoot, dude, a big lug. And it, so, it's sad because he... There was some light, there was some like light, you know, bright lights 
that kind of glimmered or shimmered. And I'm about to sneeze. Austin, hold on one second. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, you know, the, like the trainers, for instance, like they, some people in the local area wanted to help him. He was still looked upon as like, you know, as an idol, like Trevor Burbick, even though he had all these fucking crazy things going on in his life and he got deported and stuff like that. He was still looked upon as a role model, at least as a fighter for like the Canadian team and the Jamaica team. And like local fighters in the Midwest area of the U.S. and like not, you know, in Tennessee and stuff like that still looked up to him because he had a name. He was the former heavyweight champion. It was John Tate, like, you know. So a couple of names that, you know, reader, uh, listeners to our show will definitely recognize. I know our buddy Reggie Kilpat would definitely recognize uh, these names. Um, Shazon Bradley is one of them. He was mm-hmm. an undefeated heavyweight that had to retire, I believe, to a, because of a detached retina or something like that. But he was, you know, had some prominence in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s. And, um, mm-hmm. excuse me, allergies are a bitch. Um, Tate was in the gym with him quite a bit apparently you know just like observing and watching and things like that and there is the briefest of youtube clips of him i guess it's the last video you can find of john tate alive that recorded at least of him in the gym while bradley is training and uh, sparring for that instance and you see tate and the ropes like yelling just he i guess he's trying to yell instructions but they're kind of inaudible but um they said by all accounts that Tate looked like he was a little out of it and like he would be yelling gibberish in the gym and he wasn't really adding much, but like at least he wasn't on the streets, you know? And Bradley used to tell him too, like, bro, you can do better. Like clean yourself up. You're smart. You have a lot to offer. Like, yeah, he was like wearing the same clothes over and over and over and over to like the point where they were like filthy, you know? And then they were just like, you know, he was like, the guy just wanted to be a professional bum. He was like, I hate to use that, but that's what it was. And then the last time John Tate was seen in public, was at Foxwoods because at this point too, you know, he started working with another heavyweight named Keith McKnight. And Keith McKnight was one of those middling 90s heavyweights that, excuse me, he could beat like, you know, lower tier guys, but I think his biggest win might've been um, beating the shit out of a washed Iran Barkley. But um, when it came to stepping up, he always lost. You know what I mean? Like I remember, you know, he stepped that, well, this was one of the fights where he lost to so it was at Foxwoods, and he was going to fight Obed Sullivan. And um, Sullivan, obviously, on the rise in the mid to late 90s. He was featured a lot in magazines, featured on Boxing After Dark, yada, yada, yada. So he fights Keith McDonough on USA Tuesday Night Fights. Um, Tate was in his corner for that night. Tate was in the gym with him for a little bit. And they said that, you know, his clothes were so filthy, they bought him a new, you know, they wanted him to look good. So they bought him, you know, some fresh pair of clothes and everything, and they brought him to Foxwoods and kiss, you know, in uh, Connecticut for this fight. And, you know, they said Tate was with it for that. Like, you know, he, he seemed excited to be around, you know, the atmosphere again and he was out of it and people recognized him a little bit, stuff like that. And he seemed happy and which was good because like that gave people hope that, Hey, maybe he want to stick to this again and like try not to be a fucking knucklehead. And, um, you know, McKnight lost. And after he lost and Tate went back to Knoxville, they said they stopped seeing him again. You know, he just kind of went back to what he knew and what he was did. But, you know, what's poignant is that um, he was interviewed, I, I think, what was it, Robert Melandlich that wrote the article? Yeah. I sent you, yeah. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but... um, I think so. Yeah, he, close enough. But he... Yeah. um. He was the one, I think, that wrote that art that wrote an article about John Tate in the Ring magazine shortly after his passing. So this was 98-ish or so. And Nassim Hamed was on the cover to give you context of that time period, all that. But it's one of the most in-depth John Tate articles you'll ever read. And at the end of it, you know, it really hits you because even though Tate is so down and down on his luck and so bad and everything else, you know, this it's still he's still a good person because he comes up and he's smoking a cigarette and he tells the his interviewer he's like listen he's like don't tell anybody don't put this in your article that i'm smoking he was like there's kids out there that might still look up to me as a role model that's heavy (laughs) well and i mean it is but also i think that in a way it's kind of like points to 
like the simplicity in his thinking too. Absolutely. Because it's like, bro, they already know that you went to prison. Yeah. You know? I like, I mean, perhaps he's still holding he's... out hope, but it's just like the sad. Well, and, and perhaps he's thinking in the context where he's like, well, I'm not in prison now, you know, like I'm, I'm yeah, coming back from prison. So I, mean... I get it. But you know, it's just, it's still just kind of funny. Um, yeah, he he definitely obviously turned into kind of a derelict, mm-hmm. and um, it sounded like he was kind of just getting what he could th- from life. Yeah. Uh, but it sounded like he also at least had some friends and people that he hung around with, and supposedly he was clean and was, was he was clean at the end. Yeah, was he doing was, well. Well, no, he was clean because there was they they confirmed it afterward. But um, anyway, he you kind of mentioned that he was slurring and there were some reports that he potentially had been kind of, you know, acting somewhat more erratic than normal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the months leading up to his death. And there might be a reason for that. So basically, um, one evening, supposedly around midnight or so, he had gone to a bar Yep. Uh, in April and he had shown up and gotten food from the bar owner who he knew and uh, ate food, went and picked up some friends or drove friends home. I wasn't really sure which. And then on the way home, driving at about 3 a.m., uh, was driving along some kind of parkway and basically crashed into, had a stroke, like mm-hmm. abruptly, crashed into a light pole or some sort of utility pole and died on the spot. And his two friends, his uh, two passengers Probably. were injured, but not seriously. And he died. He was pronounced dead on the scene. And actually, there were a bunch of news reports that came out where they're just kind of like, uh, you know, they were like, you know, your average traffic reports. Ah, well, the reason why traffic's slow this morning because a guy died last night driving on some. Yeah, they didn't like, mention him by name at first. Yeah, you didn't even know. Yeah. And then, yeah, later on, they're like, oh, you know, and we kind of like how we talked about in the beginning. Like, you know, this guy was a heavyweight champion. And, and I know the title was split. I know that it's tough to parse through the fucking WBA champions of the early 80s and shit like that. And, I, you know, I know, I get it. But nonetheless, you know, like you would think that any degree of heavyweight champion people would just want to latch on and they want to forget they'd want to keep him around and shit but it's like the same way in death you know like he was just kind of anonymized or whatever at first um and then he was so young he was only 43 yeah he was a young guy the initial speculation was uh in all the early reports you know the the police say that alcohol may have been involved in this crash police chief says alcohol might have been involved and then they confirmed later on, no, there was no alcohol involved. He wasn't high. He wasn't drunk. He literally just had a stroke. And so the next specu- bit of speculation was, oh, you know, a fighter, he had a stroke. Do you know, did he get, did he have a punch, you know, a, a stroke punched into his fucking brain or something? And I get it. You know, it's kind of like a logical next step, but no, they confirmed because uh, it was, if not for a medical examiner, actually, a curious medical examiner. They were basically about to let this go and they were going to say, I was probably alcohol related or some, or some other drug related thing. And he just kind of had an episode. Yeah. Yeah. He just had an an episode and he died. Well, apparently there was a, a curious medical examiner who thought, well, this doesn't match, you know what they're saying? Like, I'm not entirely certain this makes sense. So they did an autopsy he didn't find what he was looking for in the autopsy. And so they did, uh, they, you know, went into his brain to see what his brain looked like on the inside and found, um, a, like a quarter sized tumor on his brain stem and said that it had probably been steadily growing larger. And that if he had been showing any sort of neurological symptoms, uh, in the months before his death, that that was almost certainly what it was. And that, that eventually just cut off, the blood uh, supply and he had a stroke and that's basically what killed him, killed him pretty much instantly. He just died. It's sad. It's incredible. It's, it's really, really sad. It's a sad ending for him too, because I mean, who knows how his life would have turned out had that not happened, had he not had a brain tumor. You know what I mean? The way his life was living, maybe he wouldn't have lived that long afterwards. You know, it's, it's tough to live that long like that. Right. But it's unfortunate that he didn't get the chance to, either you know what i mean and that he's becoming like almost a forgotten footnote because i guarantee you nobody knows nothing about him dude 
oh, there's not a lot out of on them online there either. There really isn't. Oh, you know, there really isn't. And then like you go in different magazines and stuff, and yeah, there's articles about them and stuff like that. But like, you know, the only Ring magazine, as far as I know, that had them on the cover. The only time the Ring magazine had them on the cover, as far as I know, um, is, and it kind of sums up his career in terms of bad luck, right? And it says worst champions of all time, Paul. And then you see a photo, a portrait, a nice portrait at that of John Tate. You know, went on. did he have a? Did he have like something in his mouth? Was he chewing on? I don't remember, but he had the cowboy hat on, right? Yeah, the cowboy hat on, the thing, like you know, a nice sweater, like he looked good. And then on the side, no, and little blip because it, it was almost made to look like worst champions ever. Here was John Tate, and on the side note, on the little small font, it says John Tate. You know big fall or something like that like you know like almost like disregarding that article and making it seem like tate was the worst which he actually was when it was when he got pulled because you look in the magazine and you see who was the worst heavyweight champion ever john tate was rated there ahead of primo carnera ahead of uh, jess willard you know look i get it at the time why they would probably rank it the way he was he was in everybody's memory that was a bad fall the way he did they thought he was a paper champion for winning that belt whatever it may be but like think of it in historical terms now from even back then not like tommy burns dude he fought bill squires like nine times like the fuck? gunner moyer and all of his other little buddies that he brought fuck, up dude. <laughs> Get out of here. tommy burns recycled the same buddies of his over and over and over that's why he garnered like 18 million knockouts as heavyweight champion marvin hart really jess willard Jess Willard beat Jack Johnson. Yeah, Fuck. there's video of some of these fighters, too. So it's like, we know how bad they are. Come Jess on. Jess Willard is probably the most unskilled champion in boxing history, especially a heavyweight. He yeah, beats just, Jack Johnson. Just wore Jack Johnson out. Yeah. Just survived on the Volvo circuit. God knows how fucking goofy he must have looked over there dancing with Buffalo Bill. And then beats Frank Moran. And then fights Jack Dempsey. Four years as champion makes one title defense. That's bet Really? And That's then, worse like, than Jack forward, Dempsey. I'm saying. <laughs> and he's not the worst champion ever. Like, come on now, man. That's just unfair to John Tate. And then you look at the current guys who have become champion in the years since Tate, some of the heavyweight champions, and you just kind of, oh, really? Tate was worse than yeah, Charles. That's it. Well, and that's a fucked up, like, to, for that to be your ring cover. Damn. Yeah, man. You know, it, it's sad. And also, too, like, he, the thing about, like, boxing fans is that they, rem- you know, even though guys are forgotten, like if you go to the Hall of Fame, even forgotten guys are remembered that weekend, you know, and Tate never had a chance from, you know, because of his own issues, had a chance to experience that. Because I guarantee you a guy like John Tate showing up at the Boxing Hall of Fame, people would have been floundering around him and trying to get his autograph and take photos. Of him. Absolutely. And he would have loved every second of it, you oh, know. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. And the way, like, you know, the way the internet has taken off now and, like, interviews and podcasts and other things have gone down and just documentaries and things that you could talk about. It's like hyper-focus on these little, yeah. And all of his contemporaries and guys that came slightly after him were able to take advantage of that. Look at all the interviews Larry, I'm losing my voice, excuse me. Look at all the interviews Larry Holmes was able to obtain um, over the years since then. Um all of these guys, they've been interviewed. If you just Google Tim, all Willard, these Google fighters who were disrespected in their time and yes. they're now like fucking, you know, we love them, you know, or just like because oh, they, they've, you know, their stories are forgotten because like they've been featured so many times, whether it was on TV, but just like talked about. Because you have all these bloggers or like interviewers out there who will go and interview these dudes, you know, and just talk to them. As much as we talk shit about Ellie Secback and rightfully so half the time. You know, I'll give him credit where credit is due, where he went out and found Leroy Caldwell or he found um, uh, other guys and, like, interviewed them at their gyms, you know what I mean? And still talked about them and asked them about current scenes and, like, you know, their past careers and stuff like that. Like, you know, a guy like John Tate, a 76 Olympian, all, he, like, he should have been on stage that day when, 30, when they celebrated the 30 years <laughs> at the Hall of Fame because you should have seen the love they had that day, Pat. Like, it was gorgeous. It was amazing. All those heavyweights were just like, and you know, not heavyweights, all the, the 76 team was on that podium, all the surviving members that was, or people that were able to be there. And they got all the adulation. And I think the only two that weren't there was John Tate because he had passed and, um, excuse me, Clint Jackson, because he was in jail or something. But all the surviving members at that point, including Leon, Howard Davis, all the ones who have since passed, were all there, you know? And it's sad. <laughs> 
I, I just feel for him because it's like he 43 is much too young, you know? And he had a lot of life to live and he had a lot of like interviews to give and other things to do. And it was like, he, even though he's a footnote in history, he plays a very important footnote in history for various reasons. And he should be remembered for that. 100% man. And I mean, you know, that's, we've, we, I try to emphasize it pretty much anytime we do one of these like sad shows where we're not just talking about like fighters accomplishments, but we're also kind of getting into their personal lives and stuff like that. Some people get upset. Some people get sad, emotional. Some people don't like it. I understand. You don't have to watch or listen. It's cool. But the point is that we're trying to remember these people as human beings. We're trying to remember them as not just these commodities that we're pushing and watching and rooting to kill and fucking maim and injure. But like, you know, these are human beings. They ain't cattle. They're not, dude. Uh, they're not animals. They're not machines. And they have lives. And, you know, there are people who survived John Tate. You know, there are people who who now, you know, still miss him and love him. So that's what we're doing with the, a lot of these shows. You know, trying to remember these fighters who deserve to be remembered and not forgotten the way that they have been, especially John Tate. Like I said, a heavyweight champion. And I know not the real heavyweight champion, but you know, who gives you? Nobody's paying attention to that now. You know, stop pretending like that's going to stop you from honoring somebody. So a heavyweight champion is forgotten as John Tate. You know, we got to talk about him. Absolutely, fucking Luli, man, because all of it, all it took was half a minute and history would have been changed. And not only that, like anyone who went through his rough beginnings, came up the way he did, was kind of exploited, but still came ahead in the game and became champion in the short amount of time that he did. That's 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 pretty remarkable, you know, and I'm not going to remember him for all of his like, you know, 80s exploits and being all this bullshit was happening in his life and talking about the you know, his his downfall and stuff like that. Sure, in the context of his story, it needs to be mentioned. But if I'm going to remember him, I try to remember, you know, him with that megawatt smile on top of the world, holding that beautiful gold, uh, big old buck, what's that old buck belt that he has wrapped around his waist after being Cosia, you know? Belts are so beautiful. I need one. Oh, those are gorgeous, man. Absolutely gorgeous. I need one of them belts. Guys, if you know if you have a line on one, or if you know a belt maker, or know somebody that knows how to make them, and I'm not talking about the eBay bullshits of the WBC and WBA. Like, if you know a legit person who knows how to make up, you know, replicate belts, hit us up because both of us want an old buck belt. <laughs> and I and I'm talking about the one that looks like it would fucking gore you if you yes. put it on. You know, like those I'm talking, yeah, that close right there. <laughs> that looked like just dangerous to wear. I want one of those. You know, to, but I mean, uh, God, man, I like was. I always, I'm always fascinated by those two because, like, so you get the regular title belt, then you get the old buck belt. Like, was that just like a commemorative belt that they gave these people? That was like the belt. That was the mean? the South African belt. Yeah. Like so the, that was the belt. So they bought that belt and the W and a WBA title, I presume, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the the old buck. So like, I, I'm I'm pretty sure you know, old buck is like a, a brand of yeah, alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they're like, I guess their signature spirit was gin. You could buy that shit. It's just that I guess getting it shipped is a fucking a nightmare. I don't, so I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know how you'd get it. And and I'm not that interested in trying it to get it shipped from South Africa. I just want the belt. But like you know, yeah, I guess that's how they started. I, I believe in the '70s, like the mid '70s or something like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, dude, they're just it's just gorgeous. It's fucking beautiful. It and really also. Is very to, to tie up kind of a loose end that I actually had mentioned and forgot to come back to. So, you know, we're talking about a sad ending for John Tate and whatever. Um, and I don't mean to downplay that by saying or whatever, but <laughs> with Bob Arum and his involvement, you know, we talked about him paying $400,000 to Ali, which at the time mm -hmm. was a lot more money. And people were like, well, you know, that's crazy. That's too much money to be paying for a belt uh, for John Tate versus Harry Quitze alone. Just that fight alone, Bob Arum was able to cut a deal for the merchandise, just the merchandise for the fight, nothing yep. else. And he was the only one taking the money where he made more than $250,000 on just merchandise for that fight, for just that fight. So the $400,000 was worth it, my friends, extremely worth it. And of course, coming in the days after we're getting this bombshell reporting about what the UFC is paying out fighters and percentages. I mean, 
I mean, you know, obviously boxing is doing much better than the UFC was doing, but nonetheless, talking about exploitation, it's there. It's very much there. So, yeah, pretty crazy, dude. Yeah, man, you know, Aram, the more we talk about these shows and the the shenanigans of Barb Aram in the 80s, and it's like, how far how far apart are him and Don King really? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, and and that's kind of the the complaint from a lot of boxing fans is that like there's too much focus on Don King. You know, for some people believe it's because he's black and the other promoters are not. I can't well, argue that man, is that, like some people it. on Twitter try to play that Don King was like, you know, a guy that saved Mike Tyson from the clutches of Jimmy Jacobs or something. Like no, Don yeah, King or like is... he was reformed or something like that. Come on, the guy killed, Ooh. I believe, two people. Like, not fuck. only that, like besides besides him like killing people before he got into boxing, all you got to do is just read into how he fucked everybody. You can say, well, oh, yeah, like, it's not like he got, yeah, but it's not like he killed two people, got into boxing, and turned nice guy. Nah, he <laughs> killed two so people, nice got guy. into boxing, was still doing gangster shit in boxing. Yes. And like Don King is one of the most scariest ones because he can turn on, turn on that charm and make you like him immediately. It's All like right, the, the Klitschko's and their story of him and the piano, where he was regaling him and playing piano, and then yeah. after like the second time, they looked down and it was the fucking player piano that was just playing <laughs> automatically and shit. <laughs> I mean, like the two. All right. The two people in boxes I've met that I knew were big scumbags, but still instantly made them made me think that like, wow, maybe they're really good people were Don King and Jose Suleiman. All right. King had me wrapped around his finger within three seconds of meeting him, just like doing like had me doing shit for him that I wasn't supposed to do because I was like running around as a gopher for showtime when I first moved to New York, right? And then years later when Sul or maybe before that, I don't remember when Suleiman got inducted into the Hall of Fame, to be honest. But when Jose Suleiman got inducted into the Hall of Fame, which should raise an eyebrow too to begin with, um, and I was doing the fist casting, I'm on stage with him, talking with him personally one on one because I have to like, you know, grease him up or whatever for that. And then he hands this you back he hands you back your wallet. <laughs> yeah, right? But he's seeing like these nicest person like bro, the way he like, he can charm you, he had me charmed within like two seconds. And maybe that's not a good thing. And thank God I'm not an interrogator or nothing because I'm probably obviously not good at this shit. But like, you know, he he has you like wrapped around. Oh, blah, 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 Puts his arm around you, talking about this, bringing up fucking Salvador Sanchez stories to you and just, you know, making you think like he's the old uncle that you never had or grandfather, right? And then like you walk away and you're like, wait, what the fuck just happened to me? <laughs> and yeah, I, I just, I just became a WBC sponsor. What? <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, yeah, Aram, he's just as conniving and, and scheming and thieving as the rest of them. You know what I mean? Like, sure, they put on great shows. They've done so much great for, you know, a lot of stuff for boxing and all that stuff. But don't try to sugarcoat it and act like, you know, they've, they don't have their fucking skeletons in their closet. No, absolutely not. He's, he's extremely experienced. And, and I'm not even saying he's bad at, at being a promoter or anything like that, but we, oh, yeah, we're just talking about not. pure. Look how long he's been around and how he's changed the game. Yeah, we're just talking about pure dirt. Not. That's all. That's it. Yeah. We're not. Yeah. He's a good promoter. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that, you know, what are the means? What are the means? And I it's mean, all like the same. It's our favorite musicians. You can't say that. Like we love certain musicians. You can't say that they were good people well or not. You know what I mean? So yeah, you've all, you've watched any of the true crime or any of the shows that we've done. I mean, come on. Work. I, I I believe we are capable of recognizing when, you know, differentiating between good fighter and like ick person. You know, like it, it happens. But at the end of the day, man, you know, John King, John King, John Tate got into some ick things, but he was a good person at heart. That's what it sounds like for pretty that's much what, everybody. That's, that's what it came out as. You know what yeah. I mean? Like some somebody that might have got mugged by him or something like that might think different, but like. By all accounts, by the people closest to him that were interviewed and were still alive or still are still alive that knew him and were close with him. Um, like I, I say that because a guy like Ace Miller passed away like a decade ago and he was interviewed in various articles about John Tate up into his passing and always gave the same story and everything like that. And then others like the guy that you mentioned who was close with him, that the bar owner who um, served him, I want to say it was like chicken wings and fries as his last meal before he passed later on that night, always had good things to say about him. And others like that, like they kept in context of what he was. And they're just like, ah, you know, I wish you can like change that. But it didn't stop them from like res respect, you know, 
they always held out hope and they always want to be like, he's a good guy. He just can't get out of his own way. Which is a story we've not only heard and read, but told on the show numerous times. And it's unfortunate, but again, deserves to be remembered. Rest in peace, John Tate, man. Yep. Rest easy. I mean, like, seriously, like out of all those, you know, that whole era, that's why we, we talk about it a lot. We try to shine light on it sometimes because there was so many victims from that. <laughs> Tate is not a is not a lost heavyweight. I don't, well, he is to a degree, but like he's not like really lumped in with the guys like the the Witherspoon, Tubbs, Dokes, you know, other court, you know, others from that like Don King part because he was already basically done by that time, you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But he still is a part of that era when you think about it because he was the start of it. Him losing that shit just like created this giant snowball, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man. If I well, and I guess it's it's worth pondering what would have happened had he managed to keep it together for that last portion of that round. I don't know. I don't know how he far he would have Like he would have won. Then he would have fought Ali. He probably would have beat Ali. I mean, I don't think he would have put the beating on him that Holmes did. I don't I mean, I don't know, man, because like it, Ali, obviously, we saw in the Burbick fight, he was clearly that shit that he was on taking the medication made him worse than what he actually could have produced. Holmes still would have beat the shit out of him, but, like, it wouldn't have been as just pathetic as it looked. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, I don't know. You know, like, he would have beat Ali, and then I don't think there would have been a unification because Aaron wouldn't have wanted it. Holmes yeah. never seen they were at odds. About unifying. And... Yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe we strung along a couple of more defenses until someone got to him. Maybe Dokes. I don't know. But, like, it's, yeah, it, it's just, it's sad because, like, all he had to do is last one more minute and his life would have changed. And instead it changed for the worse. And in all, like, you know, reoccurring interviews after that, he would always say that was the thing that brought him to that depression. I mean, his wife definitely held him down, too, and fucked him up. And in various interviews after they split, Everyone always said that John never stopped loving her and that definitely, like, you know, precipitated his fall. But, like, you know, the fight that he lost and losing that lug, the the money that he could have made against Ali, and just having Ali as that name, you know what I mean? And, like, on that, on his resume, just lots of bad luck there. Lots of bad luck. It's, it's wild. I don't know how far he could have gone. So I don't think any unification would have happened either. So, but just based on kind of what we saw of him, it doesn't really sound like he would have been able to stay consistent and stay champion for super long. Just being honest, yeah. you know, absolutely. I agree but, with you on that. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. You know, but like the heavyweight division that, or, you know, that wide open back then, like absolutely. maybe fight close here in a rematch, quick till kind of like what, what uh, Weaver ended up doing, you know, and then, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, regardless, well, man, rest in peace. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a bit of a downer of a subject. So I know it's kind of like takes some energy to kind of go through and research and read about it. I appreciate it, man, for sure. Absolutely. You as well, man. Like we both, both of us are the same type that like, I'll find an article, send it to you. You'll find shit, send it to me. And like, we always keep on like bouncing stuff back and forth. Even if it's not on a show that we're into, it's just anything that we find interesting that we're going to do that on. So when it's not actually on the subject that we're going to do, yeah, it makes it even better. But, um, Sure. I appreciate that, and I appreciate everyone that listens to us too, because you know we put in the work for this. So for sure, man, that's yeah, for sure we did. We we yeah. did our looking around. We did. We and it, trust me, it wasn't easy, man. There's not a ton out there on John Tate. Unfortunately. No, there really isn't. But that was that's kind of the point. Is why we wanted to kind of do a little bit more and go, you know, a little bit in depth. But so. hey, everybody, thanks so much for listening. And if you listened in whatever podcast app you listened in on, you know, I know we're trying to take care of that too. We recently switched uh the provide the podcast host or whatever it used to be on blog talk it's been a fucking nightmare because they were supposed to forward it to all the other anyway excuse excuse but it, well, it's not us point is it'll get back on track thank you so much for listening if you watched on youtube thank you so much too go ahead subscribe leave us a comment those kinds of things we'll answer back as far as social media goes uh you know we're still on twitter for the Time being, my boy Eris is on Twitter as Punch Zone Eris. On um, there's Boxing History. Find also the Knuckles and Gloves podcast on both Facebook and Instagram. And we'll see you there, man. Eris, talk soon, bro. Have a good one, y'all.